Once more, look over the accounts of the administration of baptism by the apostles of Christ and observe how they were that were baptised. We read indeed the households baptised them, but inasmuch as there were many families that have no infants in them, nothing can be concluded from thence in favour of infant baptism. It should be first proved that there were infants in the households before any such consequences can be drawn from them, and besides, it will appear upon a review of them that not infants but adults persons in the several instances are intended. Lydia's household consisted of brethren whom the apostles comforted and would not be infants but adult persons. We have no account of any other. No other are named. If any other can, let them be named. The jailer's household were such to whom the word of God was spoken who believed in God and rejoice with him. Stephanus his household, which is the only other that is mentioned in the other mentioned, is thought by some to be the same with the jailers. But if not, it's certain that it consisted of adult persons, such who addicted themselves to the ministry of saints. It would be easy to observe that the first persons that were baptised after our Lord's resurrection and ascension were such who were pricked in the heart, repented of their sins and gladly received the gospel. Such were the 3,000 who were baptised and added to the church in one day. The Samaritans, hearing Philip preach the things concerning the kingdom of God, were baptised, both men and women. The instance of the eunuch is notorious. This man was a Jewish proselyte. A serious and devout man was reading in the prophets of Isaiah when Philip joined his chariot, who after conversation with him, desired baptism by him, to whom Philip replied that if he believed with all his heart, he might be baptised, intimating that if he did not, notwithstanding his profession of religion and external seriousness and devotion, had no right to that ordinance. And upon profession of his faith in Christ, he was baptised. Cornelius and his family, and those in his household whom Peter preached, and on whom the Holy Ghost fell, were ordered by him to be baptised, having received the Holy Ghost, and for that reason. And at the Corinthians, hearing the Apostle Paul, and believing in Christ, he preached, were baptised. From all which instances it appear that not infants, but adult persons, were the only ones being baptised by the Apostles of Christ. Now, though we might justly demand a precept or command of Christ to be shown expressly in joining the baptism of infants, before we can go into such a practice, since it is used as a part of religious worship for which we ought to have a saith the Lord, yet if but one single precedent could be given us, one instance produced, or if it could be proved that any one infant was baptised by John the Baptist, by Christ, or by his orders, or by the apostles, we should think ourselves obliged to follow such an example." Let this be shown us, and we have done. We will shut up the controversy and say no more. Strange that in the space of 60 and 70 years, for such a course of time, ran out from the first administration of the baptism to the close of the canon of Scripture, that in all the accounts of baptism in it, not a single instance of infant baptism can be given upon the whole. We must be allowed to say, and if not, we must and will take the liberty to say that infant baptism is unscriptural practice and that there is neither precept nor precedent for it in the word of God. If the doubt is concerning the mode of baptism, whether it is to be performed by immersion or whole body or by sprinkling or by pouring of water on the face, take the same course before we ask. For the old paths, inquire how this ordinance was anciently administered in the times of John, Christ and his apostles. I shall not appeal unto, nor send you to inquire the signification of the Greek word, though all men of learning and sense have acknowledged that the primary meaning of the word is to dip or plunge. But this ordinance was appointed not for men of learning only, but for men and women also of the meaner capacities and of the most plain and simple understandings. Wherefore, let all inquiring persons consult the scripture instances of baptism. 
Read over the accounts of baptism as administered by John and you will find that he baptised in Jordan. Ask yourselves why a river was chose when a basin of water would have done. Had it been performed by sprinkling or pouring, try it if you can, bring yourself to believe that John was not in the River Jordan, only on the banks of it, from whence he took water and poured or sprinkled it. And if you can seriously and in good earnest conclude with a grave divine that if he was in the river, he had his hands, a scoop or some other instrument, and with it through the water over the people as they stood on the banks of the water, on both sides of him, and so baptised them in shoals. Look over the baptism of Christ by John and see if you can persuade yourself that Christ went ankle deep or a little more into the River Jordan and John stood upon the bank and poured a little water on his head as a mysterious painter and engraver have described them or whether the most easy and natural sense of the whole is not this that they both went into the River Jordan and John baptised our Lord by immersion which when done, he straightway came up out of the water, which supposes he had been in it, and then the Spirit descended on him as a dove, and a voice was heard from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son. Carefully read over these words of the evangelists. And John also was baptising in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there. And try, if you can, make much water to signify little or many waters, as the word may be literally rendered, only a little rile or some small rivulet of water, not sufficient to cover a man's body, though the phrase be used even of the waters of the great sea. And persuade yourselves, if you can, that the reason of the choice of this place was because much water in it was not for baptism, as says the text. But as for the convenience of men, their camels and asses on which they came to hear John of which it does not say one word, to which add the instance of the eunuch's baptism, in which we are told, both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and that when baptism was administered, they came up out of the water. Now try whether you can believe that this great man who left his chariot went down with Philip into the water, ankle deep or knee deep, only to have a little water sprinkled and poured upon him, and then come out of it, when in this way the ordinance might as well have been administered in his chariot, or whether it is not most reasonable to believe from the bare narrative, from the very letter of the text, that their going down into the water was in order that the ordinance might be administered by immersion, and that when Philip had baptised the eunuch this way, they both came up out of the water. As for the poor weak criticism, that this is to be understood of going to and from the waterside, it may be asked why they should go thither for, what reason was there for it, if done by sprinkling? Besides, it is entirely destroyed that the observation of the historian makes before this, that they came unto a certain water, to the waterside, and therefore when they went down, it must be into the water itself. It could not, with any propriety, be said that when they were come to the waterside, after that, they went to the waterside, but to proceed. 